they have to be rounded characters and interesting characters and entertaining characters. I mean, the one mistake always is not to be entertaining. Welcome to Blitzscaling a Startup. I'm Thank here you. with John Dryden, uh, who is, uh, as far as I can tell, and I am a big fan of fiction podcasts, the best fiction podcast maker uh, in the world. Um, and as far as I can tell, or from my okay. perspective, I think podcasting is the most important form of, uh, of storytelling now. So, so okay. John, we're, but thank uh, you. Thank you. I'm very flattered, but you know, I don't think that's, that's necessarily the case, you know, uh, but it's great that you think so. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> and, and, and John, what we're going to do today is, I mean, you're, you're a master storyteller, um, and uh, what we're going to do is try to get some insight from you that entrepreneurs like me can use for, um, you know, thinking about our businesses and talking about our businesses, communicating our businesses. Uh, folks can use this for talking about the business to investors, but also to customers and just any stakeholder. Uh, like, like humans think. Mm -hmm in stories so um maybe let's start john with uh talking about you and, and, and kind of like weaving some some elements into here so you were born in is kuwait right so in the middle east yeah that's correct yeah my parents and, uh, okay. yeah and then so, so your one of your well-known podcasts, the one that, that I like, um, is called Tumen Bay, and mm -hmm. it takes place in you know non not a real location, but that's you know loosely based off mm -hmm. um, you know the Mamluk uh, mm -hmm. Empire and like Cairo, and and maybe uh, what we can do is you know talk through like. So, so to what extent was the fact that you were born in the, in that region, to what extent, like, how did that influence your choice of, um, of settings of like world, uh, to, 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 to make this podcast in? Okay. I mean, firstly, you know, it's all about selling a, a project and, and so, you know, with Tumen Bay, like like all all the audio projects we've made, we 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 have ideas that we try and pitch to commissioning editors and persuade them to buy it. So, you know, there's there's got to be the right place and the right time for every idea. And it just so happened uh, the BBC were looking for for kind of ambitious projects, world building projects at that time. Yeah, they're not always looking for that sort of stuff, you know. But at that time they were, and um, you know, and at the same time, Game of Thrones, when we first pitched uh, Tomb Bay, was at its zenith. You know, everyone was talking about it. So, you know, there was a lot of interest in, you know, something Game of Thrones-ish, you know. Um, and running parallel to that, as you say, I was I was born in the Middle East and was raised there largely. Um, and, well, my parents only left the Middle East, you know, when I was in my mid-20s. Um, and so we spent a lot of time in Egypt a lot of time in the Gulf states and, and traveling around. And so for me at that age, it was home. And um, whenever I go there now, it's it's very kind of nostalgic for me, the smells, the sounds, all that sort of thing. So, you know, that that world, that landscape has always been a, a part of me. And um, so there's always been stories in my head ever since I've been a, a kind of creator and writer of, of fiction podcasts and scripts you know i've been looking for the, well those stories you know having come from that background has always fed into almost everything i've, I've done whether it's been thrillers or, you know but in the case of tuman bay this historical it's kind of historical fantasy i'd call it set in um in the, in the mamluk era i was always very aware that the mamluks were not really very known about at least in the west no one sort of really talked about them and and, and yet a, an incredibly fascinating you know period of history two to three hundred years um 
from I think about the 12th century through to the 15th century um, and at one point you know Cairo was under them was the wealthiest city on the planet you know and people went there from everywhere from you know from India from Europe because there was work there you know if you're a great artist or a great artisan or builder or, you know craftsperson you would go there because there would be great commissions even you know some of the great italian painters were were kind of um hustling for business you know with, with the mamluks and um so i was aware of this story for some time and it just seemed like a, a great world to set a fictional um drama in um so so i guess those two things happened in parallel that the bbc were looking for uh, at the time were, were looking to commission a big world building type series um and I'd always wanted to do something on the Mamluks. So they kind of met. Yeah. So, so one of the things that I love is kind of like a nugget from what you're saying is this kind of the concept of why now, where, and this is something that, that people talk a lot about in startups, um, which is timing. And, you know, uh, and, and I love how, like one of the things I like about talking to people in other fields is seeing how timing matters in all fields. Um, so like for you, the, like the, there's kind of this cultural context where people are really interested in world building and kind of like history because of Game of Thrones and that, you know, made it easy for you to, um, to do that uh have you found that to be a, a, a kind of like common thread um, yeah throughout the kind of like you, you, your career yeah um i mean i i always believe that a good idea will eventually you know find a home somewhere but it doesn't always happen immediately and and we've had ideas that we've pitched and then they've been rejected by everyone and you know and we've just kept them a little bit in the background until the right moment and then eventually got them through um it it usually happens to be honest you know if, if you really believe in an idea it, it it is all about timing it's about finding the right home for it at the right time um and particularly in the business of getting funding and commissions and stuff like that there are times when the people that have the money to invest in that kind of thing are very bullish and, and are looking for stuff and there's other times um, where they're more hesitant and, and decisions take longer to come. Um, and it's easy to be, you know, dis disheartened by that when it, when things don't sell. Um, but I think when you're confident in a project or even enthusiastic in a, a project that you really can see the potential that maybe others can't see at that moment, then you do need to hang on to it and, and keep, um, I wouldn't say keep hustling everyone and it's because you know, the last thing I want to do is annoy people <laughs> and let's say every time they get an email from me, their heart sinks, but look out for where the right fit might be, because usually if it's a good idea, there is a right fit somewhere and you just have to find that. Oh, I've lost you now. I can't hear you at all. Oh, now you're back. Yeah. Sorry about that. So, so, so the, um... Tell us a little bit more about the Mamluks. Like they were, if I understand correctly, they were Turkish. They're Turkish Christians, and then been brought down to Cairo, which is a Muslim um, civilization. Or city. yeah, okay, uh, yeah. I'm um, not so remember this. This we made this over a number of years, four seasons. So I'm I'm not an expert on the Mamluks, but I I did research them a bit. But yes, that's absolutely correct. They they came from um, Turkey. They were they were brought over as slaves, Christian slaves, um, by the previous dynasty, um, and um, they were very capable. Um, they were very good fighters. They were very smart. They did a lot of jobs in the administration. They 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 were very trusted, and eventually they you know formed into a sort of body of their own. They became Muslims um and um and took over you know and and so obviously they weren't slaves anymore um 
but certainly the first few generations of them were and they were just incredibly adept at fitting in and making the whole system work to the point where you know when the previous regime became a bit weaker they they took advantage and 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 became rulers themselves and were very successful and, and there are a lot of details in Tumen Bay uh which are you know come from like from that right so you talk talk a lot a, a lot of like slave owners and slaves mm. and uh there, there's one little anecdote that um a historical anecdote that i found really interesting which is these um uh, you know these essentially instead of having dolls they would have you know actual baby <laughs> slaves uh, yeah yeah that there's a lot of true details in that and um yeah there was a a time when princesses in the palace instead of being given dolls would have been given slave babies you know to sort of play with and drop or do whatever they wanted and but some of these babies died obviously you know were mal but um but some of them didn't and became quite powerful figures in their own right they survived and um yeah. but you know a and lot of the reason the yeah. reason for that is that they couldn't have because they're muslims they couldn't have uh your depictions of people is that right yeah exactly that you know it, you couldn't have depictions of, of humans in paintings or sculptures it, it was blasphemous yeah such an interesting yeah. you know little bit of history and, and okay so so what i'm trying to get here is like what I'm feeling from you is that one of the ways in which you made Tumen Bay so rich and interesting as a story is um, that you were just intrinsically interested in that you know period of history in that area of the world, and it was also a you know real thing that you base it off of and it's a you know, multi-layered complex world that you could draw from and having done many stories and i assume like i know you're, you're you've done a lot of other very successful podcasts um you know one of them is passenger list um but uh, you know, i've done a bunch of them like like, to, like how is it different or is it better to tell a story you know that, that's rooted in something that's so interesting and that you're so interested in like like how how, how does that feed okay. into yeah. storytelling i mean everything is is potentially interesting it really is you can create a story out of anything and i think my interest in the mamluks was um important and and probably essential to what we did with Tumen Bay um but it's I, I would say the difference between that and passenger list um which also I'm, I was very interested in passenger list was inspired by uh you know the missing uh, Malaysian plane that is still a kind of mystery but it was a mystery when it first disappeared for several months that really gripped the world so it, it's a story yeah. like that but the difference is that with passenger list it was very much designed as a podcast where you have a single character the sister of one of the passengers on the plane trying to find out what really happened and 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 so it was very kind of audio friendly in the sense that if you get distracted for a few minutes or go away and come back to the story you're never really going to be lost because it's still her trying to find out what happened to the plane with Tumen Bay it's much more a kind of in a, a fully uh immersible world where there's lots of characters with lots of stories and so it requires a greater level of investment from the listener which is not what well, it's not for everyone you know so it can be a little bit niche that because it's a you've got to focus a little bit um but but possibly is more rewarding for that if you really get into the characters as, as i know some people have um and i think but i but i think you know my background have of being brought up in the middle east maybe that affected the tone of it a little bit um that it's it was it's the kind of world that i was interested in and very fond of 
but I don't think um, it was it was necessary. I, I think it, it probably could have happened without that, because I think almost any subject you can find out about, and um, and at the end of the day, it's about the characters and it's about relating to the characters and um, not necessarily liking the characters. You know, certainly with Tuman Bay, most of the characters um, are very flawed or even not very nice in many ways. But if you understand why they're doing what they're doing, um, they they become relatable and you find some. So the listener hopefully will find something in themselves in there, you know, that that makes them relate to that, that character. Um, I mean, with a case in point with Tuman Bay is one of the characters that people seem to really love was this slave trader called Ibn Bai. Um, and, you know, so he was doing something pretty nasty, which is, you know, he was buying and trading slaves, which, you know, but for him that was completely normal because of the world he was living in. But but despite that characteristic, you know, what he was doing, he was, people seemed to to like him as a character. And he had a lot of the same sort of problems that people have you know he was dealing with builders in his house and the, you know everything was getting more expensive than what he was planning so there's a lot of sort of things happening he had a daughter that, you know that he had some issues with and um you know so i guess what i'm saying is characters need to be relatable but they don't necessarily need to be likable i don't say you'd like him but you could understand him and you were kind of rooting for him in some respects as well um and by a relatable, what you mean is, for me as a listener, I see myself, like I kind of like can see myself in the story of Ibn Bay. And for that reason, like I, I think of the, the broader story, so I can see myself in the character of Ibn Bay and for that reason, I kind of like think of the story as being about me, right? Like that's that's what you mean by relatable, or what? what or like how how do you kind of define relatable? Um, I, I would define it as, yeah, uh, recognizing something within yourself from that character. Um, it's interesting the idea of are you the character in the story? I think for some people that possibly is the case. I think often when you watch a movie or read a book, that is the case. You're sort of in the head of the character. Um, and I think that's a kind of, that's kind of important as well. It, with a, with a kind of on, when there's lots of different lead characters, like with Tuman Bay, I suspect you jump into the heads of different characters as the story progresses. Uh, yeah. And um, I think, I think another key thing with these characters is they have to change in some way um or not change and and then that's the point of their character you know but 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 generally particularly with a if there's a single character that's that you're following through a story there's a kind of point where they start and there's a point where they end and that's a journey you know that you go on with them um and talking about you know the companies and, and startups and things like that that that's a very important aspect of that uh you know of, of companies and, and entrepreneurs telling their story that the people they are telling their story to they're pitching to want to know what that journey was you know where it started where it's at now and and where it's going to be going from now and and that's a journey of change and people love to jump on board you know with change you know and help one of the things i've been thinking about a lot recently so i'm just starting a new business right and when you start a new business you're like there is a lot of change and i think the way that i've been thinking about it is it like what people want so let's take investors because that's you know the main stakeholder that um th that's constant for me at my stage right Later, customers matter a lot more, but let's say investing. I, I think what they want, or the way that there's a kind of a charismatic way for them to think about what you're doing and to get like really engaged in it, is for them to kind of like see themselves through you 
and see them and, and like participate in this growth. So it's kind of a, a combination of this kind of like hero's journey, mm -hmm. um, you know, transformate personal transformation, but they're transforming vicariously through you or like they, they kind of, it is them that is part that, that is transforming. Like they're part of it and they're, they're, they're actually at the center of it. And, and I'll tell you, you know, an example of this, so, so that, that's a like concrete from what I'm doing uh, and how I'm like trying to like craft that story for them. Right. So, so what I do is I have a, a, a small batch of people who are really, really top notch investors that I've worked with in the past and who will invest time to understand what I'm doing and, and help me and jump on calls like that. And what I try to, what, what I do is I send them like quarterly updates on what I'm doing. And I ask them for input. And because they're super smart people, I actually benefit tremendously from their input and I need their input and it's actually helpful. So like in a very real way, we are like, I'm doing most of the grunt work, but like we're co-creating this business together. And it's their ideas often in real life, which, which oh, in actuality, it is their ideas that shape my thinking and shape the direction of the business. And what that is, is in a way storytelling, right? Where it's like, hey, this is like, like us, right? It's not, it's not me, it, it's like you're part of this and you're actually the hero of this. And we are together going through these transformations, facing challenges, this is working, this is not working. And, um, yeah, it's kind of like the way that I, I try to craft that engagement is an engagement that you know follows this same story arc of, you know, it's really about them, like they're the hero, and then they go on a hero's journey through me. Um, th does that, you know, resonate with you or make sense? Yeah, very much so. Um about a year and a half ago, we were um, acquired by a, a Swedish media company. I saw that. And um, congratulations! And, oh, thanks. Yeah, and um, so we so so I do have some experience of what it's like being a small startup and then trying to grow, and um, and also presenting the story, you know, of our journey and who we are, um, and that is, you know, something you need to project to you know, potential investors and they need to understand. And as you say, come on that journey with you, you know, at, at the point that you've got to at that point, because it's a continuing journey that will continue with them as your, you know, uh, you know, co-travelers. And um, so, yeah, that that's very much right. I think, you know, when you get to that point of investors and stuff like that, they really need to know who you are and what you're hoping to do. Um, and where you've come from um, all that's really important if, you know for them to decide whether they want to be travel companions with you so, so when you're telling these stories right and and, and two and bay is a really interesting one because it's a it's a very complex story yeah right and, and like how do you like so there's this kind of like like a very simplistic level you have a hero who goes on a hero's journey faces challenges has transformations you know has tools that they use to you know improve themselves and become better and, and overcome these challenges and they they do and they they've transformed and they're they're superior in some manner uh, at, at the end and, and so it's, it's like a hero the hero is the reader essentially i vicariously and then they go on this hero's journey, but like, especially in a context where things, where the story is really complex, AKA Tumen Bay or mm -hmm. real life, mm -hmm. um, building a business. Like what are the other things that keep, like, like what, what is it that keeps people engaged in the story along the way given all the complexity and the fact that you actually are not, it's not just someone going on a hero's journey. Mm. It's that there's a lot more going on. So like, what are the other? Yeah. 
Well, I think you know, the elements for a start, all, all the characters that you're focusing on have to have a story, you know, so um, there'll be different stories, but they've each got to have some kind of arc. Otherwise they're, they're just there as, as sort of bit parts, but you see, so I guess initially if you're doing more than a single character journey, you have to decide who are the other main characters that you're following. Um, you know, in every scene, you have to decide whose story that scene belongs to um, and be very clear in your head about that when you construct that scene. Um, so with, with something more complex like Tomb and Bay, you are essentially following several characters who are all going on a, a journey of their own, not necessarily the same journey, probably different journeys that will intersect at different points in the story. They'll have different wants and needs, um, and some will make it, some won't. So some of those storylines will be tragedies, you know, it'll end badly. Others will be stories of triumph. Um, so with a multi-character show like that, that's kind of what, what you're doing. You're, you're following the same kind of rules, but you've got several characters that you're following. Um, and it does allow you to make the story quite rich. Um, you know, I do think audiences are craving, particularly audiences in audio fiction, are craving stories with meaning. I, I think generally younger audiences are, are, are craving that because there's been a lot of stuff, uh, you know, that is that doesn't have meaning. And um, and I think um, I, I think people are looking for stories that that are kind of rich in in, in meaning. So. Um, having uh, an, you know a lot of characters like that does sort of help you do that um all those characters would would need you know relatable characteristics they again they wouldn't all be likable some might be likable but they all need to be understood by the audience in some way the audience needs to listen needs to understand what makes those characters tick just the ones who you know you're following because there'll be a lot of other bit characters that will just be there because it's useful to have them there to do certain things. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Do you mind if I tell you, like, so, so I, I'm just trying to, to think about this from, from my perspective as an entrepreneur. And, yeah. and I, I'd love to hear, like tell you what's going on in my head and, and see what you think. So, and, and also I have like a specific question. So like when you are talking about these, like, A, I find super interesting and totally correct, but not what I was thinking that the complexity comes through multiple people like it's like the way we think is through people and people's stories so you have the kind of like hero which is me everyone's a hero of their own story and they like to think of every story as themselves as a hero but then there are others and the complexity is not objects and places it's other people who are going through their own story that they can understand or relate to and in a way, right, like if you think about this from as a startup or as a business, or if you think about me reporting to potential investors, those other characters are team members that are co-creating this business with me, right? Like mm -hmm. they do exist. Like there's a person, let's say the co-founder who's a chief technology officer. And if I'm trying to, you know, explain our technology um like 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 the business's progression uh and learning and, and and evolution in terms of the technology i shouldn't be trying like i should be trying to tell that story as the story of the chief technology officer not as the story of the technology and i find that so interesting um the, the so so a like, does that, well, I'll stop there. Does that kind of like ring any bells? Like, do, 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 does that make you think of anything? Yeah. I mean, I think if you're creating drama, whether it's based on real life or, or it's complete fiction, um, for it to be dramatic, for it to be engaging, it has to be about the character. Um, it's not about the information. The information has to come through what the character does 
But if characters are just telling us stuff, as a rule of thumb in drama, that doesn't doesn't really work. You, you know, because what you need in drama is tension. You need opposition always in every scene, pretty much. Um, otherwise, it it's, it feels flat and uninteresting. So if you're just being told stuff, it kind of it, it's very easy to switch off. Um, whereas when you have a scene where there is some sort of opposition you're clear what one of the characters i mean when i said before you've got to decide whose scene it is so it, every scene will belong to a character you have to decide what does that character want in that scene in that moment what's in the way of them getting it and there you have some conflict of some sort and it becomes interesting it, suddenly you're in a situation with are they going to get it are they not um are they going to succeed are they going to fail or are they going to somehow you know circumvent and find their way around the whatever it is stopping them getting what they want but if you haven't established that in your mind at least as you approach every single scene the scene will be flat you've got to decide what is the who's the main character what does the main character want what's getting in the way what or who is getting in the way of what that character is trying to achieve and what's going to happen are they going to succeed or fail or go okay go so another way? There are two things that two questions popped in my mind. First is, what is like what is a right number of characters, and in what situations you want to have? Like, I don't think it's ever one, right? Like, there are very few stories that are that are good. They're just one person. Even in your passenger list, you know, there's it, like one. It's one person's voice, but there are other characters. It's just one person. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's yeah, a difference maybe. between whose story you're following, you know, how many characters you're following uh, as opposed to how many characters there are in the story. So with Passenger List, it is essentially you're following one character. You know, she's, of course, she's encountering many other people, but you're invested in her and her quest. And it's very, very clear what her quest is. She wants, she doesn't believe the official story of what happened to this missing plane her brother was on the plane. She wants to find out the truth and she's going to go and visit every relative of all the other passengers until she gets to the truth. It, it's, it's her story you're following and she's meeting a lot of people, but it's not their scenes. It's not their, it's not their story that you're following. It's hers. Whereas two so they're there, kind of extras. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. they they still have to have flesh and bone on them, you know, uh, but but essentially they are I, I wouldn't call i mean they they have to be rounded characters and interesting characters and entertaining characters i mean the one mistake always is not to be entertaining <laughs> you know it's got to be entertaining but um you know they need to seem real but it's not them that you're rooting for you're not inside their heads if if you listen to passenger list you are in her head and and with Tumen Bay, it, it's the same, but you're in five or six characters' heads. The question of how many um, characters you can, whose heads you can be in, is you know one to be debated. I don't think there is a, a definitive answer. And as soon as you come up with an answer, someone's going to prove you wrong. Um, I think we we stretched it quite far with Tumen Bay. There are four or five main characters that you're following and, and rooting for to some extent but there's probably 20 or 30 other characters that they're encountering and meeting along the way who are there because they need to be there they're in the story and they're they're very much real people but you're not necessarily in their heads or rooting for them so, so what happens when you have more characters versus less like what's like if you pull that lever right like hey we're gonna have five characters versus one let's say what's like what changes like what what changes about the story obviously it gets harder to follow right, yeah if you have more yeah i mean not necessarily hard to follow. It, it requires a little bit more focus um but if it's well it's you know it has to be well constructed um I guess what changes is you have more scope for those character stories to interweave and cross over. And it may be that you're kind of following a character who will be the antagonist to someone else's story. 
and then you're kind of in both their heads, which is kind of interesting. It's, you know, it's a very interesting way of doing things, I think. Um, right, so it's like, it's, so, so, so I guess if you have only one character, it's, you know, so let's say if I'm telling a story and my story has one character, it's easier to do that. It's like more simple. Um, and it's easier for people. It's easier for me not to lose the, the audience. But yeah. it, it, it gets flat at some point, right? There's a lot. Well, it, mi of... it might do. There is the danger of that. But not if you're really invested in their story and, and they really have got, you know, a, a story to follow. You know, that they have something they're trying to achieve and and the obstacles to that escalate. Then I think, you you, you know, that is, is doable. But... Yeah, I mean, the, from a practical point of view, the difference is if you have a single character you're following, you're going to have a lot more scenes with that character. If you've got five characters you're following, you've got less time to, yeah. to become you know, engaged with those characters. They're going to have less scenes. So you're going to have to do more with those scenes in a way. Um, but it's a balance. You know, you if you've only got one character, you've got to be sure there's enough story for that character to, you know, keep being interesting. I mean, one of... The, one of the kind of um, techniques, you know, and it's it's very well known, but it's something that, you know, it's, it's sometimes forgotten, particularly by uh, less experienced writers, is this, this kind of idea of a pendulum. You know, for a story to really move, you, you want things to go really well for a character and then things to go really badly for the character and then things to go even overcome that somehow and things go even better for them and then it gets even worse you know there's a kind of pendulum swing um that keeps you know keeps you interested in that character and that's a very key thing to sort of structure into how your story works whether you're telling a single story a single character story or or, or it's you know you've got lots of characters there's there's, there's it's very difficult to make a story work if things just go okay for the character all the way through the story you know, it's just not. Yeah, that and it's not. And, yeah. It's not just, you know, going well, going badly, then going well again, or whatever. Uh, like it's it's a pendulum, or it's like it's going fine, it's going badly, it's going well, it's going fine, it's going well, it's going badly. Like you have to, has to, oh, it has to be all alternating between that all the time. And and how do mm -hmm. you, how do you think of the risk of death in <laughs> that? Right. So it's like th there's like the reality is, I, I guess, in real life that people can die. Right. So they can go off on some quests and, you know, yeah. badly and then they'll just die. Right. And, yeah. and how does that like how does the risk of, you know, sudden death um, or on not sudden death of death come into making that pendulum swing? feel engaging um well i mean you've got to have jeopardy you know so there, there's something at risk and that makes the pendulum engaging if you suddenly kill off a character and it's a single you know if you've only got one character and you kill them off well that's it isn't it really you know and you, you're then going to be starting if you it, if it's continues as a show you'd be starting with another character or a backstory but it'd be a different story in some way um, in a in a um, ensemble show like Tomb and Bay, you can very surprisingly kill a character that appears to have a story arc that you're going to follow, um, and we did that a couple of times in Tomb and Bay. It was it seemed like a good idea. It often seems like a good idea when you're writing it. Uh, there's some occasions when I've kind of re regretted it because I've missed having that character and all the things and, and felt that we didn't quite do as much with that character as we could have done um but it's i guess the effect is i guess the the effect ultimately is quite kind of gimmicky and that it just provides a great shock moment where the audience are just not expecting that because you've set that character up to have some kind of journey and then you've just ended it so i think you can do that in an ensemble piece it's very difficult to do that in a single character piece you know unless right the, the story is going to pivot in a totally different direction you know with different characters and stuff um but you but yeah but, and Je but this, jeopardy is key yeah and think of this as a like like let's say if i'm telling the story of my business right i'm telling it through 
so let's say there's um like I, I the ceo and the main character in a way right like i'm one character that people can be invested in and then uh, and i think when i was building my last business i would insulate my like my co-founder would like the, the investors would never find a cure about him like i think we actually had investors that didn't even know i had a co-founder um like i, I he was just not part of the story and I, I think there's an element where it's like, you know, if you have multiple people, right? So like me and my co-founder, let's say, it can make the story harder to follow, but more more engaging in a way um, yes. and, and makes it easier to tell the product side of the business because that's what he was working on rather than the kind of customer side. But then there's a risk which is let's say things fall through and you break up with your co-founder or, you know, whatever. Um, and if there are just two characters in the story, or let's say three, there's like the investor plus me plus my co-founder and you kill off one of the, the three uh, characters, it's actually, you know, feels like not good to it feels like you're as you say like you're telling a different story this is no longer the same business i'm following but if you had a more multi-layered story that you're telling meaning by multi-layered i mean like multi-character story so let's say you had five characters total um that people were aware of and were invested in at different levels if one of them was killed off it would actually be fine. Like you're, you're, you're yeah. not, mm, yeah. You, there's like less risk of introducing a character because there actually is jeopardy in business, right? Like things can. Absolutely. Yeah. Alter. Yeah. That's a, that's a very good sort of example. You know, so if there were five of you pitching a, a business to investors and they liked your story and what you do and they invested and one of your five, uh, you know, colleagues disappeared or died or whatever um it's not such a big deal for the investor if if you've pitched your startup on your own to an investor and they like you and your story and then you suddenly completely disappear or die that's that's the end isn't it yeah yeah i find that so like thinking i said the kind of like aha moment thing for me is like I, I I've you know when I tell the story of my business like so I think essentially like when you meet somebody for the first time and you you introduce them to your world right like you're trying to tell a story with them as a hero but if you want to keep them engaged over a long period of time and you want them to understand the multifaceted reality of your business the way to do that is to tell those other facets like tell the story of those other facets through the story of the leaders in your business who are responsible for those facets and one of the risks of doing that is that people can be just thrown off if you're if one of the main characters are following dies, right, or mm -hmm. just quits or whatever it is, well, if you have a like, let's say your leadership team from the investor's perspective is five people or four people, you know, like there is this real peril. Things are getting better and worse, and and there's a lot of complexity and in interconnect interconnection between the different characters and and their goals. Mm -hmm. and, and you can be okay with one one piece of the business aka one of the characters not doing well or dying or leaving or whatever it is yeah i don't know uh, what you think yeah i mean I, I think in terms of investment and and pitching your company which as i said we have you know we went through that um you know, unless you're selling a particular 
so if it's about the let's assume it's about the characters so it's not like the investors are buying a, a you know some patent patented software or some product that you've you know so that the individuals don't matter but if the individuals are what they're investing in then the only thing they've really got to go on is where you're at now the journey that got you to this point the struggles and obstacles you had to overcome um the personal cost perhaps you know what you have personally invested in getting to this point and your vision for what you hope to achieve and the only thing they've got on they've got on you really is is how you've got to where you are now and 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 you know no one has a crystal ball they don't know what the future will hold so they will invest on the basis of how convincing they find your journey so far um and on the assumption that if you've made it you know if it's been a good story that you've told them uh, and you've you know you've made it to this point then the chances are you will you will continue on that journey at, you know to the to the kind of El Dorado that you're 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 envisaging. Um, it's a risk, you know, for them obviously because they don't know what the future is. But but I guess if they think you have successfully completed half the journey, they you know it's they're basing the journey that will continue on that, and they're going to take the risk on that basis. So, so it needs to be a good think? story, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like the, the thing that's like becoming really clear to me is that there is a difference between the story that you tell to somebody who is following you, who's like, you. Here we've been talking about investors, but let's say customers, right? So you meet meet a new customer, and you want to tell them a story about your business and your product the first time you meet them. And you want that to be a kind of succinct, clear story with essentially one character and yeah. uh, that's them, right? Mm. And um, that's kind of like their challenges and how you're working on solving them in this manner. And yeah, that's, the sen that's essentially your elevator pitch to them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then if you want to tell, like you want to keep folks engaged long term, you want and, and so, so so the way like the analogy i'm using for that is your podcast passenger list that has one character and if you want to keep folks engaged over four seasons right so long term over many years as customers they want like that's too much of a flat story and you need to introduce additional storylines and storylines is just additional characters and uh, so it's not just about them anymore. It's about them interacting with the CEO, the CTO, the chief marketing officer, whatever. And um, okay, my so, so so that's kind of like where my head is at. And what I want to ask is beyond the number of characters, right? In these two types of stories, the more complex, longer term engagement story, and the kind of crisp. Uh, simple story beyond the number of characters what what is what else like what would be the other one thing that really differentiates these two types of stories so say like what what is the uh, like if you're comparing tuman bay with passenger list beyond the fact that passenger list is just a story of one woman and her mm, yeah. like journey and, and Tuman Bay is multiple stories and multiple people. What what is the other kind of defining characteristic of the different types of stories? Yeah, I mean, I think the world building is is a key part of it. Um, you know, with Passenger List, everything was presented as though it was recorded by her on her phone um, or down phone lines. So it had a very focused point of view. Um, with Tuman Bay, the world of the story is is a character in the story. Um, I I think it, this is peculiar to audio to some extent as well. That if you have a lot of characters, it's much less followable 
in audio so it has to be very honed and constructed if you're going to have more than one character but if it was a tv show for instance like say succession is is very much a kind of ensemble story you, you don't you know it, it, television audiences are used to that they've got a lot more visual clues it, it's much easier to have an ensemble piece succession is is very much an ensemble piece but most tv dramas would have different points of view simply because you've got the visual element um and i think if you had a single character story in tv where you're just following one character exclusively that would probably be quite hard to pull off in tv i, I don't know i haven't got any particular examples in my head but um most shows you know have more than one character that you're kind of following um but that's not always the case in audio it's sometimes much simpler to, you know to have a very focused point of view yeah so it's like more characters slash more complexity equals more multimedia and vice versa like multimedia requires uh somehow more complexity because otherwise people get bored because it's too, too i think too so flat. yeah i think in some ways you've highlighted the difference between the the mediums you know the way people listen to podcasts there's quite a lot of distractions going on you know a lot of people are listening on their earbuds but they might be driving walking there's other stuff in the real world impinging a little bit on that story um and it, when you're watching you know a, a netflix show on tv it, it's usually you're at home you're focused on that you might be having your dinner you know you, you might exchange a few comments with you know your partner or whatever as you watch it but you're essentially focused on that show um and i think with audio you, you're not listening to it sitting quietly at home in the evening you're at the gym or you're traveling to work or you're driving and there's the real world is is um impinging on that slightly so i, I think it's important to keep that in mind when you're making these shows yeah, and interestingly, you know, in real life, if you're trying to tell the story either to customers or investors or employees or whoever it is, most of them are distracted by a bunch of other things. So, so in a way, it's much That's more true. Yeah. similar to audio. And then you can maybe counteract that by being more multimedia because of multimedia-ness uh, forces additional focus in a way because it, it takes all their senses or something like that yeah yeah um... uh, okay. yeah so, so so like uh how do you so so human bay or let's say the, the, the people listening would be more familiar with uh game of thrones or lord of the rings or whatever right these yeah. are kind of like world building uh, exercises um and there are you know say a space opera a dune is a popular one now mm. it, it is an a, you know similar example um and, and it strikes me that one of the things the that is different between who and bay um so these and passenger list which is is that passenger list is much more familiar, right? So like passenger list is about a woman who's going through events that are in the, in the real news for real people. And, you know, she lives in, you know, current day world in Britain, I guess. And, um, America, that's while Tuman Bay is much more, you know, foreign, uh, mm -hmm. and, and and it seems like a lot of these kind of complex world building projects it seem to have that characteristic in a way right where it's like yeah a, so so like how do you think of familiarity as a um, yeah. component uh, between those two different types of stories yeah you're right i mean a lot of those shows do have a sort of an other world kind of setting that shows you much like Dune and, you know, and I think you, 
people like to escape to a different world. So that's, that is a kind of genre. And with Tomb and Babe, that's kind of the same. You know, you have to be very clear what the rules of that world are. Um, but the characters still need to relate and feel like people you know or relate to things about yourself. Um, with Passenger List, it's a US story, essentially. Um, it was very uh, much more like documentary in style and like something, you know, I think a lot of people listen to it thinking it was real, you know, because we went for that um, kind of rougher, less polished kind of yeah. production approach, you know, it, and, and as I said before, it was all meant to be like, she was recording these interviews surreptitiously on her phone. So it had that, that kind of sense actually takes a lot longer to create that convincingly than. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Um, and um, and I guess that has gives it a kind of lean in immediacy. Also, it's set in the real world, you know, contemporary world that we're living in now. So if, you know, a lot of that feels familiar. But, you know, I guess for us, it was important to make it seem very authentic to the real world so that it, it could be confused for reality in some respects. And for the performances to be much more like just regular people talking um so what what do you mean by lean in immediacy well what i've found you know with traditional radio drama where it's recorded in studio and you have you know very good actors and um there's a kind of there's a slight distance in quality of that sort of drama because it it feels like a stage play of some sort. Um, it feels like acting um, because it's too polished. Um, whereas I think if you, for instance, have something that sounds rougher, like a phone call, and you can't quite hear what the person on the other end is saying, and you've set the scene up right, that there's a, you know, that you're already, the audience is already invested in it. There's something at stake. Then that lean in quality is, when you can't quite hear that word that guy said down on the phone, you're leaning in a little bit more to, to really try and, you know, and because because you're um you're already hooked into the story, you're invested. So quite often, um, with with a lot of shows we do actually, where we're going for that more slightly more documentary feel, um, we we try to sort of, um, you know, we try to fuck up the sound a little bit, to, and that takes quite a lot of effort because you want to get just the right level of not being able to hear the key word because um that actually leads the audience to be more uh keen to hear it than if it was all presented to them in a very clear way so that's what i mean it's kind of <laughs> like let's say watching this podcast versus watching 60 minutes or a kind of tv version that's like super polished and yeah kind of set it has a it has a different quality and what you're saying is that the, the um, it's somehow more engaging because it forces you to it forces a listener to participate by making an effort to to kind of like follow uh while if you just like spoon feed everything through like super high production quality like it's more accessible immediately, but it retains people less because they yes yeah they, they're less invested essentially yeah. But but to get that to really work, it is super high quality production values. It just sounds, you know, it, it's really hard to do that well because it isn't just bad sound recording because that doesn't work. You need to be able to really control what the audience does hear and what what they don't need to hear. What, it's part, what it's part of the storytelling. But like, what specifically do you, d d does that mean? Like, what do you, what elements do you kind of fudge? Um, I, you, it's it's absolutely, you know, line by line, deciding what does the audience need to hear at this point or not. Um, there's, you, you, you know, the, we do a lot of work on kind of what's going on in the background to make it seem real, and sometimes, say, someone walks through. Um, you know, a crowded room where maybe there's a party going on. There's a show called Tagged, which we, a thriller that we made last year for Sony. And there's a scene in an art gallery where 
the characters sort of move through and you hear little snatches of conversation of people that they pass by um to to get that we would be doing huge amounts of kind of improvisation with actors um and just trying to identify little nuggets that are going to be delightful to hear you know either funny or or you know just give a real a, a sense of that world and um so i guess i mean that you know that you you, you could record everyone and hear everything and then understand nothing you've got you know you, the director essentially in an audio is treating the microphone like the lens of the camera you've got to point it to what you think is important at that moment um and that's a that's a great skill you know a directing skill um because if you're hearing stuff that isn't contributing to the story then it's kind of pointless you know you want everything to 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 help create the illusion that this this world is real and these people are real uh, right so you're kind of like sprinkling in your know, mistakes i guess but fake mistakes that you you made up um well in the case of passenger list yes there's a lot of kind of microphone bumps and stuff like that yeah because that that is the sort of that's the grammar of the story that she's recording it on her phone so there's a lot of yeah intentional mistakes but but i yeah, guess so, in, yeah but but the so, so you like sprinkling in these mistakes but you're picking what seems to be a mistake so that it actually contributes to the to, to the, the richness of the story to like what you're trying to say so you, everything's about telling telling the story and clearly getting the characters across to people and one method that you have of communicating like a kind of like additional bandwidth that you have is like the mistakes bandwidth so you have like the, the show bandwidth and then the mistakes that we made on purpose mm -hmm. bandwidth enables you to get additional information in is that is that yeah is that, is that an accurate yeah. way to think of it yeah it is i mean if it's a show like tagged that i've just mentioned where it's not the you know the idea is not that it's all being recorded on someone's phone then we wouldn't have kind of microphone bumps and stuff like that but we would have a sense of the actors moving off mic and on mic because what we would be going for is a sense that the audience is actually there in the room with those characters um and if you're really there in the room the character might turn away from you might walk over there the, the sound would be coming from different places you know um and so we would try and build that in choreograph it so that it gives the illusion of being there you know what we're after is a little bit like when you read a book that you can't put down like a thriller or something like that you are just reading words on a page but in your head this whole world is starting to exist you're seeing the characters you're seeing where the characters are when you're really into a a story that you're reading that's what we're using every kind of technique we can find to try and do in in audio fiction so we're a little bit over the time that we'd set uh so i'll wrap this up i had not noticed um before researching this that you also made life after which is a great yes audio po fiction podcast that uh, I, I loved um more sci-fi um or sci-fi ish yeah. um so so goldhawkproductions.com is probably the best place on the entire internet to go to find audio uh fiction right now uh and that's it has the, the that's your production company it has a list of all the shows that you made which are just the best in the world um Thank they're you. they're there where else um where else can people find you um well on any um podcasting platform you know apple Podcasts, we're all over that it's it's probably useful to start on our website to see what the shows are and then they are all available on um the various podcasting platforms um and i know tuman bay is, uh, not tuman bay passenger list is your most famous podcast but um what is your favorite podcast that you made that was not su successful that was not successful um well i mean success is measured in many or different not, ways 
yeah. as <laughs> not so not well as, known. Uh, yeah. yeah, not I, as well known as it should be. Yeah, I mean, my favorite probably is a show we made last year called "There's Something I Need to Tell You," which is a a global thriller. Um, uh, a little, I, I guess it's a cross. It's, it's a little bit kind of Alfred Hitchcock, but it's also a little bit flight attendant. I don't know if you saw that. Um, and it's about a young couple who are on holiday in Dubai who witness a, a kind of assassination that takes place at their hotel and then get drawn into this murder conspiracy. And we're about to make a second season of it. It was released by the BBC. So it's part of the limelight strand that they have. And it's called There's Something I Need to Tell You. And it's up for quite a few awards this year. So we're we're pretty thrilled that they've commissioned a second season. But I would say, you know, it, it's not as well known as Pattern List, but that's partly because it was on the, you know, it, it was on a, a curated feed. But um, that's my favorite show yeah. I've ever made, I think. It's called There's Something I Need to Tell You. It was just... Where can you find it? Um, you can find that on um, any podcasting platform. It's oh, in really? the Lime, okay. yeah, Limelight feed. Um, okay, with okay, Limelight, okay. because it's a, because the curated feed, they put each new season on top of the other, so you'd have to go back a few seasons. But it's got a very memorable title. There's something I need to tell you. Um, you'd also uh -huh. find it on on BBC Sounds. Yeah, right. Well, for us Americans, we uh, we can't access that unless oh, oh, I really? think if you use a. I think if you use a VPN, you can. But otherwise, they don't let you. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, well, any it is available on all the podcast platforms, but you just have to scroll back a few seasons because right, so you um, have to look up limelight in yeah, limelight uh, on, yeah. on Apple podcast. Okay. Well, this yeah. has been super interesting. Uh, I, I don't know if you, you can tell, like I'm learning so much just talking this oh, with thank you. you. And um, uh, thank you for the time. Oh, it's been fascinating. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And thank you for everyone who, uh, who joined us. I'm sure, uh, you know, you guys have learned as much as I have. And, um, uh, make sure to listen to John's podcast. Uh, they're the best. So, uh, John, I'm going to end the stream. Brilliant. Okay. Good to talk to you. Uh